When we went back a few lessons ago and we, we talked about scale options, and you looked at chart number five, melodic minor was one of the scales. And I sort of tabled it. I said, well, you're not going to use that so much right now. I want to address application of the melodic minor. There are a couple different applications. The one we're going to use right now, and I'm going to give you some tabbed examples, you will instantly recognize the sound is created by the insertion of this melodic minor. Now, the melodic minor is just like Dorian, but it's got a natural seven instead of a flatted seventh. Another way to perceive the melodic minor is that it's a major scale with a flatted third. But I like to look at it in terms of the Dorian, but with a natural seventh, because then you can insert it in applications where you'd be using Dorian. And it's a good sound. Well, I want you to look at this move, and you'll kind of chuckle when you hear this. Example 11. We've heard that in lots of songs. Some corny songs, some great rock anthems. And all that's happening is, if you look at example 11, you have your D minor chord, root, flat, third, fifth. We have three voices, three voices. First voice is the fifth. Second voice is the flat third. We number them, number them from the highest to the lowest. And your third voice is the root. I know my chromatic scale, a little sidebar. I know my chromatic scale this way. If I'm ascending from the root, it's root, and then a sharp one, same as a flat two, same as a flat nine. Then a two, same as a nine. Then a sharp two, same as a flat three, same as a sharp nine. And then so on, right on through the scale. So if I'm descending, I know that I have eight or one. Half step down will be seven. Another half step down will be flat seven. Another half step down will be the six or the 13. So once you memorize those 12 positions in the chromatic scale, it makes it real easy to organize things. So we have a D minor, and this is labeled in example 11. D minor major seven, that would be the proper chord symbol there because if we, we don't want to call it D minor seven because in the next one, D minor seven occurs, and in a D minor seven chord, you have a flat seven, then D minor six. What I want to point out is, whenever possible, I like to use a fingering that minimizes left-hand motion, and that also helps me sustain voices, be more like a piano. Well, if I start off with this D minor using my first, second, third fingers, I'm okay from here to here, and you might say, well, I could have been barring here and go, but now I'm in trouble because I've got to lose everything to grab the D minor six. Hence this fingering. Your second, your third fingers will not move. And you simply use your fourth finger for the root, for the natural seven. Then your first finger comes around, grabs the flat seven. So you have a very nice move right there. And we'll play around with that in a few minutes. That's putting that moving voice over there on the third string. Example 12 takes the same chord, but instead of having the fifth on top, we're going to put the root up on top. And then we're going to drop it down so it really sticks out. There, it's a very high pitch sound. This is one of those harmonic moves that you just need to have some options. That's very prominent. It's pitched high, it's voiced high, it sticks out in the mix. So if you were playing guitar and I was a producer and I didn't want that sound, I would say, okay, can you drop that down an octave? Okay, no problem. So I'll play this D minor. I go back to my D minor. Example 13. See how much more effective that is? It's just more subtle, it's a little cooler. It doesn't stick out in your face so much. I'm going to compare example 13 to example 11. Here's example 13. Big sound difference. Let me play along with the track so you can hear the first three examples, examples 11, 12, and 13, and you can choose for yourself how they're effective in different ways. That's example 11. 
Example 12. Example 13. Very effective, right? Now we're going to keep the machine running because we're going to take this and lean it out even more. In example 14, I have moved out of my area, so I'm going to drop down here and grab my flatted third. Big, big difference. Example 14. Example 11. Yep. Example 12. So you can hear a lot of different things going on there. Choosing the register is very, very important. So um, be an arranger in your playing. The final thing here is example 15. I actually have played this in some of these examples where I just arpeggiate it. Real common Latin rhythm, so I apply that to any of these chords. But that particular rhythm is so effective when the f lowest note is that moving voice. I don't have it tabbed, but I do want to point this out. If the chord symbols said D minor, D minor major 7, D minor 7, D minor 6. Now this is again me as an arranger and writing charts. If I write that, the bass line staying on D. Whereas if I wrote D minor, D minor over C sharp, D minor over C, D minor over B, do you see you would voice it differently? This would work. But I'd probably have you... And you might say, well, I'll let the bass player do that, and I'll stay out of his way. That's smart. Just go... You just stay on your D minor, and then you can go... You can start playing all those little fills, because you're not going to fight what the bass player is doing, as long as you're careful with that flat 7 versus a 7. Don't start putting in a flat 7 when he's on the 7 and vice versa. You have a little bit of clash. So you've just learned a move in this area. There are some other places you can play this. But get these under your fingers because you're going to encounter these on lots of tunes. And it's also a great little move in your soloing that you can run this little chain of minor, minor major 7, minor 7, minor 6 in your line with pedal tones and things like that. It's a great tool. Well... Up to this point, we have taken your stock D minor chord with the A minor form, added the 9, added the 6, added the flat 6, added the flat 7, added the 11. Here we talked about adding that natural 7 in a moving voice. What I'm going to do now is increase your chord vocabulary by giving you some tabbed chord voicing. So for the next lessons, you're going to see groups of five chords, which you'll just apply to the jam track.